Welcome to another episode of At the Table with Patrick Lincioni. I'm your host, Pat Lincioni, with my co-host, Cody Thompson. How you doing? Doing great. This is the podcast where we explore anything and everything having to do with teamwork, leadership, culture, and other topics related to the world of work. So... And normally you ask me what the topic is, but we're going to switch roles today and I'm going to ask you, what are we talking about today? Today we're going to talk about the craziest cause of job misery, something that is so obvious and ridiculous that we're going to think, how can we possibly do a, do a podcast about it? But we're going to talk about how people feeling anonymous at work kills their ability to love their jobs. In short, an- anonymity. Anonymity is a job killer. And it's so obvious that we think, well, that's, you know, what do we need to talk about here? Most of us, after listening to this, are going to say, I don't take an interest in the people I manage enough, and the people that manage me don't take an interest in me. And if we could change this, we could change the world of work and certainly make a huge difference in the lives of the people that we work with. Great. Let's, let's get into it. Right. So this is one of those things that uh, comes from my book, the, uh, the Truth About Employee Engagement, that used to be titled... The Three Signs of a Miserable Job. Exactly. Turns we'll, out people don't like having that book on their uh, desk at work. <laughs> yeah, people said, we like this, but I can't <laughs> take this book to work. So right. we finally retitled it. But job misery is a real tragedy in society. People spend a third of their waking hours, at least, at work. And if they come home feeling demoralized, this is a real problem for their family and their friends and for their own psyche and their own self-esteem. And in many ways, this is why you went down this path, path to begin with, right? That's the right. The story of your dad. Yeah, my dad. Dad used to come home and be frustrated by his management, the people that managed him, and I didn't know what that meant, but I learned it for myself on my first day of work after I graduated from college. Oh, let's hear that story. Yeah, so I I interview with this great company, a really, really well-known company that was a great place to get a job. Everybody said this is the best place to work for in America. It was actually written in an article that year. So I interviewed there, they offered me a job, and then they proceeded to recruit me so they would take us to dinner, and, and I was working with all these partners or, or, or going to dinner with them, and we would go out for drinks, and, and I thought, these people really care about me. They're laying it on pretty heavy. Absolutely, yeah. and I thought, this is going to be so fun to work here. So I accepted the job, first day of work, I go there, and it, it, I, I was like, do you guys remember me? It was like <laughs> nobody recognized me. The partners would walk by, they wouldn't even say hello. Nobody took an interest in anything going on in my life. I felt completely anonymous, and so did all of my colleagues who got hired, and we were like, what happened? Did they lose our resume? Wow. And what we realized is they were never really interested in us as people. We were just a commodity, and as soon as we realized that, it was just a series of miserable experiences. In fact, I'll fast forward. One of my friends who worked there, six years later, he finally left. I only made it two years there. They said, what could we have done to keep you here longer? And his answer was, Anything, <laughs> anything would just, have been just, fine. Yeah, okay. Just try. Acknowledge me in the hallway. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so anyway, that's where I realized, I didn't know it at the time, but one of the biggest causes, in fact, I will say the biggest cause of job misery is anonymity, feeling like you're unknown. And I love that story because it is really like a flip of the switch. One day you felt like your managers were taking an interest in you. The very next day you were panicked that you were at a new job and they didn't care. Exactly. And I've come to realize everyone feels this way. Even people who would seem to be, they don't have a lot of emotional needs. If they're convinced or suspect that their manager doesn't know anything about them and care about their lives, and I don't mean just personal lives, I mean what they're working on, who they are, what's going on Mm. in their life. If you believe that your manager is disinterested in you or doesn't know what's going on, you cannot, cannot like your job. I don't care if you're making millions of dollars in in, in a beautiful office or if you're a professional football player or if you work in a hospital. It doesn't matter what you do. If you don't think your manager cares about you, it's done. Well, and then, and then the, the opposite is true, right, as well. So when you do experience a manager that actually takes a, a vested interest in you, it's hard to leave that job. Absolutely. In you know, fact, we, we talk about, you know, prior to coming on, talking about um, people, that phrase that people leave managers, they don't leave jobs. Exactly. And this is what it boils down to. And companies go, why are these people leaving? Are we not giving them enough benefits or what's their comp? And it's like, first of all, look at their managers. Now, there's an exception to this. I've only met one person who said they would actually prefer to be anonymous at work. And I'm going to ask him why that is. <laughs> this is Connor, our engineer. <laughs> it's because I work with my, my dad. <laughs> yeah, so he would like a little more anonymity. Would, it, you mean be talking great. about your girlfriend before we get on the podcast is not a, your ideal form of, of being known at work? <laughs> Uh, you know, that actually did happen today. 
He has a great girlfriend, by the way. Shout out to Madison. <laughs> Let's talk more about it. He's totally. Like, he's giving us the move. <laughs> move right why, along. Son. This is right. when yeah. anonymity would be preferred at work. Okay. But for most people, that's not the case. And you said it's a positive thing. I want to tell you a story. It's one of my favorite stories to tell. I probably told it a hundred times. I get goosebumps every time I tell it, Cody. Let's hear it. Here it goes. A friend of mine, her name is Nancy. She was studying to be a nurse. She was actually functioning as a nurse. She's not in that career anymore because it wasn't right for her. But she, she, and she never felt quite right in it except on one night of the week or on the nights when she worked in the emergency room at the hospital, whenever the one particular doctor was there, she loved her job. Even though this wasn't the right career for her, mm. she loved her job. This guy's name was Dr. Trimble. We always want to get that right because somewhere out there, there's a Dr. Trimble and he's an awesome guy. So when Dr. Trimble was, was running the emergency room, all the nurses were like on fire for their jobs mm. and they could never figure out why. They were like, what is it? What's it going on? She finally figured it out one night after a really difficult night in the emergency room. So after, you know, when you're, when you're a nurse, after the, your shift is over, you have to do your charting. Right. So sort you're, of debrief the whole Yeah, night. and you're going through all the different cases you had. Well, she was listening to Dr. Trimble, who was actually talking to an intern who was following him around. So Dr. Trimble was going through the, he was doing a debrief with this intern, talking about all the different cases they had. And, and he said to the guy, hey, did you notice after this one really difficult case we had, it was really bloody in the, in the ER, and we finally got that patient shipped off to the, emer- to the operating room. Did you notice the, the um, orderly who came in and cleaned up the room for us? And the intern said to Dr. Trimble, no, I, I didn't see the orderly. I didn't notice him. Mm. And Dr. Trimble said, oh, that guy's name is Jose. Jose lives down the street from the hospital. His wife's name is Maria. He proceeded to tell him about Jose's three kids. He's from Honduras. Here's what's going on in his life. Here's what's going on with his kids right now. And he said to the intern, he said, I want you to get to know Jose tomorrow and come tell me something about him that I don't already know. Wow, that's incredible. And Nancy was like, that's why we love working with Dr. Trimble. Absolutely. He took a genuine interest in the people that worked for him. And when people, when a manager takes an interest in you, really knows what's going on in your life and goes and what's going on in your career and what your aspirations are, it's almost impossible not to enjoy your work. Yeah, and it's not just related to your business. I mean, like you said, personal life and aspirations at work, but just being known in general, coming into work, being being known by the person that that greets you there that makes all the difference in the world. I I have a similar story, actually, a friend of mine, uh, his name is Nate, and he used to run an assisted living facility. And uh, he was a a new person to this facility. He had been there about a year. And one of the groundskeepers that worked and like kept the the, manicured the grass and the the hedges and those sort of things, um, he found out it was his birthday coming up. So he wrote a birthday card and- and To the groundskeeper. To the groundskeeper. And uh, he told me the story about a week afterwards, that man came up to him and, and in tears saying, I've been at this company for 15 years doing this job and not once has anyone ever acknowledged my birthday. The amount of goodwill that that developed with that particular employee, but the staying power for, for that person, like he now feels like he has a, a place where he's known. And, and that he, makes all the difference. And here's the, the crazy thing. That is so ridiculously simple and just human. Oh, absolutely. You know, and if we were, if we had my, my 13 year old son on here, he'd be saying, of course you should do that, dad. That's just being nice. (laughs) And the people listening to this are probably having dual feelings right now. They're probably saying, gosh, I totally know this. And many of them that are managers are thinking, I don't do that enough still. Mm -hmm. And it's not about going out and doing birthday cards and knowing everything that's going on. It's about saying, how much have I forgotten how valuable that was to me when I was a new employee? Yeah. And how we get so caught up in what we're doing that we forget to keep acting on that. And the truth of the matter is, if you had to put a value on it, it's, it's immeasurable. I, don't, I didn't keep, you know, my first paycheck or a first, an email announcing that I was getting a bonus. But I remember holding on to emails from my managers that said, hey, I'm concerned about your dad, what's going on with his health, or, or hey, I heard you did a really good job at this project the other day. We all crave to be known and appreciated and it's so obvious and so free that we often forget to do it. And when we don't do it, Cody, it's like we might as well be taking money out of our pocket and throwing it into a fire because we're wasting one of the most valuable opportunities 
to make people excited about their work. And I think it goes back to the idea that it's not, it's not good business practice. This right. is just being a good human being, being interested in others, wanting to learn more about people and what their aspirations are. I mean, that's why it feels like it strikes a chord with so many people in their work environment is that's probably the place it plays out most negatively that people feel most unknown, but this is a basic human need. Right. And we forget that because we think it's all about stock, you know, are they, are they, do they have company stock or do they have the right benefits or are there any right perks that we're giving them? All things that are okay to talk about, but if they're not known, none of that matters. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about this. I, I like to use this example because years ago I got to know somebody, a professional football team, a general manager, and he read my books and he said, I want you to come and watch, um, come to training camp with us. And so I got to go up and stay at this hotel and watch the players and hang out with them and eat with them and watch them practice. And, and it was, I was a kid in a candy store cause I love like the draft and trades and players. Yeah. But one of the things I noticed was that these guys didn't seem very happy. The, the overall satisfaction of these people, these guys that were getting paid a lot of money to play a child's game <laughs> um, for half the year weren't all that excited. Mm. And I couldn't figure out why until years later, I became friends with a head coach in the NFL. And he'd come by my office and we'd chat, a great guy, but his team traded for this really high profile young player who had a series of attitude issues. And so I said to my friend, I said, hey, are you going to have this guy over for dinner and get to know him and find out what's going on in his life and what makes him tick? And my friend said to me straight on, he said, no, 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 Pat, this is a business. We don't do that. This is not college football or high school football. It's a business. He knows what he has to do. I'm not going to do that. Hmm. And I thought, no wonder these athletes are so seemingly unhappy when they should be on top of the world. But in professional sports, all too often, coaches and managers and general managers don't really get to know these kids. And it's no different in the business context. I mean, we, we, Happens all we the time. talk about how sometimes, and I'm going to ask you a question about, you know, where does it go from being interested in them, you know, in them personally, and, and are there parameters around right. what should and shouldn't be shared in that context? Sure. But I think far too often, we think it's sort of taboo to talk to someone about their personal life. It's like, is it feels like an HR violation to go ask someone how their weekend was or is something bothering you or is something going on at home? Right. And we live in California. It's now, I don't know if you saw this, Cody, but there's a new law that says you can't make eye contact with somebody at work. <laughs> <laughs> I would believe it. <laughs> but the point of the matter is this, you have to have good judgment and you have to have emotional intelligence. And you know, there is that one person who's going to come into the office and go, I need to tell you about my cat's worms again. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh gosh, too much. Yeah. But for every person like that, there's a thousand that just want a human relationship. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, if you're just, human and reasonable and kind more often than not people get sued because they don't have a relationship with that person and then something goes wrong and they're like screw them yeah but when you know somebody and care about them 99 and a half times out of 100 they're going to appreciate that and give you the benefit of the doubt so what we have to do is not let lawyers and bureaucrats tell us how to treat our employees we need to go back to the rule of thumb, you know, the old golden rule and treat them the way you would want to be treated. That's, that sounds great. I, I want to go back to what you said. Don't allow the lawyers to dictate how you treat your employees. Oh my goodness gracious. Because it feels like we do that all the time. It feels like we're so afraid of, of overstepping that we don't even engage in, in productive, meaningful relationships. Uh, the risk of being sued makes us be inhuman to human beings. And that really has an impact on their personal lives and on our, our, the view of ourselves as managers and leaders. And yet, we still do it. Mm. And we, have, we live in a society that says getting sued unfairly is the worst thing that could ever happen in your life. Mm. Where I think just not being human and loving on other people is, is much worse. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm thinking about all my friends who are at, at, at jobs and the way they've talked about companies that they've left. And really, while it can seem very simple, and it is, it's just getting to know people and, and understanding what their, their needs are as a human being, this can be like a culture of management at a company. I mean, if even one or two or three uh, managers end up not feeling like they should you know, reach out to their employees to know more about them, it can really sort of trickle down to the whole culture of management. And I hear friends that have left jobs you know, here in San Francisco or otherwise, where the way they talk about the culture is actually them talking about their manager. You know. you, yeah. You know, uh, here's a, one more story before we move on, because we want to give people some practical advice, because you can change the culture of your company, the engagement of your employees and your bottom line by instituting a very simple practice in your organization. One more story. Amy, who works with us, she had a good friend who worked in the travel industry and she studied this in, in school and she thought she got her dream job. And so she was working in, in this company that did travel and she loved it. She thought she was going to. And within weeks of working there, something was wrong. And over time, she would come home and say, 
this is, I'm miserable. What is going on? Well, she finally, she got pregnant. She had a child. She went out on maternity leave. She came back. And for the first four months after she came back from maternity leave, her manager did not ask her a single question about her child or about, you know, the whole process. And she was like, no wonder I hate my job. This guy doesn't care about me. See, she had the perfect job based on industry and skill set. But what she didn't have was a manager who actually cared about her. Hmm. And this happens all too often, which is why I like to talk about Dirty Jobs, that show with Mike Rowe, um, because so many people on that show are doing really crappy things. And they enjoy, yeah, they're, they're loved what they do. Because if they work with people who care about them, no matter what you do, you can actually like your job. You can have what looks like the most perfect job for your skill set. It pays well. You live in a great, you have a great office with a great view. And if your manager doesn't care about you, you're going to wonder, why am I not happy? Hmm. And it does go back to, this isn't just about the, the best way to manage someone and to be a good human being to, to another person. But when you talk about attracting people that, that want to work at your company or retaining the right people, this, this has implications for so many things and it's free. Yep. It's free and simple and easy and way more people should do it. It's ridiculous. Now, now let's uh, do our first commercial because we have some bills not to pay because yeah. they're still unpaid. <laughs> we have no sponsors yet. So, so, so wait, what, no do you, what do you want to do a commercial for, Cody? Well, we just had my daughter's first birthday. Um, and Quinn is adorable. Quinn is adorable. Now, I wanted to give a shout out. I don't know what company makes these. I'm sure many of them do, but it's a bib and it's an improvement on the old bib, which was just a sheet of, of silicone. It right. has a little trough at the bottom. So Ooh. as she's stuffing cake into her mouth, little bits of cake are falling into the trough and it acts as like a little snack compartment for her to eat later. So, and it, and aside from that, it actually prevents the mess from going all the way down. That's great. Dress. You know, honestly, I should take that to the movies. <laughs> Laura laughs at me because I miss half the popcorn. I'm like <laughs> yeah. a cookie monster, you know? Yeah. And at the end of a movie, I'm just covered in popcorn so i should take that with me i could save some popcorn and uh, i'm a big advocate our dogs are not fans of the bib they, <laughs> yeah they that's don't get right quite as much cleanup but. that's right okay so let's talk about what an organization could actually do small company big company what they could do if you're a manager or you run an organization you could say i want all my managers to write down the names of all the people that work for them Very simple. write them down yep. and then write down next to that what do you know about them what's going on in their life what's going on in their work where, what are their aspirations? What is, uh, is anything else that's interesting? And if you, if you know a lot about that stuff, ask yourself, have I talked to my people about this? And in the areas where you don't know, if you're like, gee, I, I'm kind of, there's a gap there, go talk to them. And this begs the question, Cody, why don't managers, as soon as they find out about this, go change the way they're managed? You know why they don't? Because they're embarrassed. Right. Sometimes they're like, oh my gosh, this person's been working for me for two years and I have no idea how many kids they have. You know what you should do if you're a manager? You should go sit down with them and say, hey, you know something? I'm really embarrassed that I haven't talked to you about your family. That's and, great and I want to change. Yeah. That No employee is going to go, yeah, you idiot. I'm not going to tell you now. <laughs> They're going to be like, that's all right. Let me tell you more. Absolutely. People love talking about themselves and sharing that with the person that they spend eight hours a day with. Absolutely. So have the courage and the vulnerability if you're a manager that hasn't been good at this to go say, I'm, I wish I had done this more. And I, I, I want to go back to how simple what you're talking about is. This is not... in implementing a new CRM or internal yeah. software that helps you track whether your employees are known or not known. You're literally talking about getting a pen and a paper, writing down your employees' names and what you know about them. And, and it could change everything. In two weeks, they will come to work with a, with a different attitude. They will work harder. They'll be glad to be there. The relationships will change. They will go back and treat their family differently. You will be a hero for them in ways that you won't notice even and some ways that you will if you'll only do this one thing. It can change everything. It's just crazy. And yet, it's still so lacking in 2019. It seems amazing. Alrighty. I don't think we need to say much more than that. It's that simple and that practical. Now what I'd like to do is open the mail. Yeah, so we have a mailbag segment. So earlier, and, and I'll encourage more people to do this, we have an email podcast at tablegroup.com and we encourage listeners to write in and get some questions answered by you. Thanks, Mailbox. We just got a letter. 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 Wonder who it's from. And, and that little jingle music we just heard was from one of my favorite shows, Blues Clues. It wasn't mine. My kids were listening to it. No, it's still yours. It's yeah, fine. You, still can, love you it. can say that. <laughs> awesome show. That's a little, there's a little unpaid advertisement for Blues Clues. Oh, yeah. Great. Still around, I think. Quinn's not quite ready, but I can't That's wait. Right. Okay, so what's our first question, Cody? So the first question comes from uh, Juliana, and she asked the question, 
how can I build a collaborative environment with peers that are not willing to make a self-assessment and look into their areas of improvement? Okay. So Juliana, you're, you're right to be concerned about that. The first thing I'd say, I'd ask you to do is don't assume that that's a permanent feature in there. Some people don't do that. One, because nobody's ever said to them, we, we, you need to be this way. Sometimes people really need to be told you need to be vulnerable. This is an expectation for working here. You need to be open. You need to be open to your strengths and your weaknesses. So one, has the expectation been set? I know it seems like it should be obvious, but it's not. And so the leader needs to be the one that says, hey, guys, this is how we're going to act on our team. Right. And if that hasn't happened, it's tough to hold them accountable for that. Secondly, do it yourself. Sometimes Mm -hmm. the first thing a person needs to open up is to have somebody else open up to them. So if you go to somebody and, and, and they've never talked about their weaknesses and you go sit down and say, hey, just I want to talk to you about something. I'm really not good in this area. I'd like to get better. What do you think I can do? Sometimes that'll be the first thing they go. That's great. I'll help you with that. But I have a few of them myself. So that might not be enough. But here's the other thing. Give them a safe, structured way to do it. Like. Go over the Myers-Briggs. It's one thing to say, I want to talk to you about what your weaknesses are. It's another thing to say, hey, you're an ENTJ. Look what it says in the book. Hmm. Okay. Um, Everybody can do that. Make it safe. Now, if if it's been made clear to them that they should do that and they're not doing it, if you've been open with them and they don't reciprocate and you've provided them with a few structured, safe ways to do it and they still don't, then you're, you're right, Juliana, that there's a ceiling there and you might not be able to break through. But give them the benefit of the doubt and do everything possible. And most people want to be vulnerable. For most people, it's actually liberating. That's great, thanks. So next question, number two, and I actually didn't write down the uh, person's name, let's call him Fred. Fred. Fred reached out. Where's Um, he from? I also didn't write that down. So let's assume he's from Greenland. Greenland. Fred from Greenland. Yeah, that I remember reading We have a big following up there. (laughs) Um, This is kind of off the wall, but I thought you'd enjoy answering this one. How can I become a better storyteller? Ah, right. Well, there are some people that are naturally good storytellers. And I I think they say people that are Irish, you know, you go to (laughs) Ireland, everybody sits around in a bar. I think they practice a lot, you know. And the first thing I would say is this, um, just get reps, just try it Mm -hmm. and do it with people, you know, that'll tell you, now that was kind of boring. That was too much information there. Ah, you kind of skipped over that part. In fact, we did this with my son, Casey, (laughs) where he was telling us a story once and we're like, Casey, you know, you need a little context for what this (laughs) is. And so, so just have that back and forth. The other thing is listen to people that are good storytellers, expose yourself to that. And there's ways to do that. There's people on TV and in, on podcasts that right. tell good stories. And YouTube, YouTube, there's a ton of resources right. out there. Finally, there are books about how to tell a story. Now, here's the thing I would say though, do it in the way that works for you. Be yourself, be human and, um, and keep doing it and don't, don't stop. You, I don't think anybody is really born a good storyteller. I think that somewhere along the line, they saw somebody do it well, a parent, or they got rewarded for it and they started doing it better and better. Great. Okay. Question number three came in from Nuno and Nuno asks, I feel a very strong responsibility, almost parental like to the team I manage. And I want to be sure that they have all they need to be performing at the highest level. However, I don't have this feeling towards my management team. So the team that you're a the team Nuno's that, peers. Right, correct. So he, the people that he sits on a team with and reports to some leader, he doesn't feel it to them, but he feels it to the people the that he The team he, he managed and hired. Got yes, it. Correct. So he's a good papa bear of, to the people down below, but as far as being one of the baby bears on the team, if you will, it's, that's harder for him. And he says, am I missing the bigger picture? Is this, he's, he's wondering, is there something that he's missing as a result of having that sort of perspective at work? Well, and though I don't know all the details here, Nuno, but the, the thing is the leader of that team that you're a member of they really need to lead the effort to build a better team. And so if that's not happening, you're not necessarily fully responsible for that. I would say continue to do the right thing for your team, but don't assume that your leader doesn't want to do this too. And share with him or her that, hey, here's some things you could do. I'd like us to have a camaraderie and a sense of teamwork at this level. And if there's anything I can do to help you with that, I will. And they're going to appreciate that. And if they don't, now you know, you've tried. But, but don't forget the Stephen Covey thing, your circle of influence and your circle of concern. Keep doing the right thing for your team. And eventually someone on your team is probably also going to say, hey, what are you doing over there, Nuno? We should probably do that too. That's really working well. Hmm. So, so it's not your fault, but you could maybe help your team do something about that. But at the, in the meantime, don't lose focus on your own team. Great. Great. One more. Uh, we got it from Jono and Jono asked the question, the context for this, I'm going to shorten it a little bit. The context is a high school leadership team, okay. essentially. So Jono works in high uh, school. 
He said, how would you navigate something like a strategic issue in a high school setting where peop- the people involved on the leadership team say that they don't have even two hours to schedule an ad hoc meeting? Right. This wouldn't be unique to a high school. So many organizations, hospitals, firefighters, and plenty of regular businesses are, we don't have time for this. And the question comes down to one of economics, Jono, and that's this. Is not dealing with that issue causing more problems than the two hours you might have to spend working on it? And the answer is always yes. Um, but it, c- calculating that economics is hard. And so, you know, I, I mean, you're in a school, there's after school, and sometimes there's an evening. And that happens in other jobs too. And you have to spend extra time to deal with that. And the benefits of that are great. But um, so I, I don't think this is unique to schools. I think that sometimes because schools are on a schedule, it feels that way. But hey, if two hours is going to eliminate a huge problem, assuming this is a huge problem, then I say you just got to figure it out. Just got to dive in and do it. Dive yeah. in and do it. And I do. We, I work with a high school right now, and they are using our meeting model, and they really do this. And at first, it was hard. Teachers were like, I don't want to have to walk across the, the school to come at one of these meetings. And they've stuck with it for two years. And the principal there, Mark is his name, Mark is making it work. So um, I think it's doable. It's just a different culture. That's great. Well, we're going to do more of this. So I want more listeners to send in their, their uh, questions here. It can be a scenario. It can even be a topic. Where do they send those us. questions? Podcast at tablegroup.com. Um, so we'll think of this as like a little bit of a consulting corner. Sit at the table with Pat. Ask him your questions. We love questions. Okay. That's going to bring us to the end of our show. Yeah. And I w- before we uh, take off, I want to remind people that anonymity and what we covered today is largely covered in your book, The Truth About Employee Engagement. That's right. Okay, so that brings us to the end. I want to remind people as we leave that the most successful companies have thriving, productive teams and fulfilled, engaged employees. They all go together. Thanks for listening. God bless.